your host, Scott, and today I'm joined by Dr. Alexander Yampolsky, who is the co-founder and CEO of Security Scorecard. Welcome. Scott, it's a pleasure to be with you. All right. So, uh, Alex, your background is in cryptography, math, computer science. Uh, it seems like it's been a passion of your, of your days since uh, youth and academics at NYC as well as Yale. Uh, Tell us about how that research and your career in security and compliance eventually evolved into entrepreneurship, which is Security Scorecard today. Sure. So um, I think that you know I think that most great startups and most great ideas uh, they take place when you're an expert in a space and you look at how things are done and you kind of scratch your head and say, "There's got to be a, a better way of doing the same type of stuff." So. I spent uh, many years in cybersecurity. I did my PhD at Yale, uh, worked at Oracle, Microsoft, Goldman Sachs, and then I became a chief security officer in an e-commerce retailer called uh, Guild Group. And uh, as a chief sec security officer, I had all kinds of tools at my disposal to uh, protect my own company. And one day we were dealing with, with a third party vendor. It was actually a, a credit card fraud mitigation solution where we would have to share customer information with that company and it would tell us how to protect us. And so uh, before sharing all my customer data, I asked that company to share with me a copy of a security assessment from some other firm proving that they're actually secure. They shared with me an assessment, looked perfect. So I signed the contract. And as we started integrating with the systems of that vendor, we logged in and discovered unencrypted credit card data belonging to other customers. And that to me was kind of like an oh crap moment where I realized that as a chief security officer, I could lose my job due to circumstances outside of my control. And uh, I don't like to feel that if I work hard and do a good job, I could lose my job. I like to think that I would get promoted if I do a good job. And so uh, this led to an idea, this led to a big realization that the market is moving to the cloud and we all are interconnected these days, yet companies, when they do business with each other, they have zero visibility and zero insight into how diligent other companies were. And the, that led to an idea behind security scorecard. Why can't there be a security score that you assign to any company in the world and that represents cyber resilience of that company? And that's really the story that uh, gave Genesis to security scorecard. Yeah, it's uh, super fascinating. And in some ways, it begs the question of why hasn't, ha why hasn't such a, a platform or product existed before you guys. Um, let's get into a little bit of the technology in terms of the underlying patents uh, that is going into some of this methodology. Can you elaborate? Sure. So I think you asked uh, two good questions. Uh, so I think what, what's interesting, before I jump into technology, what's interesting about entrepreneurship is that, and that's an important lesson I learned as a founder, if your idea, when you are just thinking of starting a company, if your idea is obvious to too many people, you go and tell them, hey, yeah, that's obvious, like, go do it, that's a great idea, you're usually too late to the game because too many com competitors are going to do this. So a lot of the time, brilliant ideas and bad ideas start similar to each other. It's not obvious to people. You go talk to them. They're like, ah, I don't know about this. And as an entrepreneur, you have to believe in yourself. You have to incubate it under the radar. And when uh, and when you're ready, you emerge. But a lot of the time, uh, kind of that's that's the hard part behind entrepreneurship. When Google got started, it wasn't obvious to people. You needed another search engine. And similarly, when Henry Ford invented uh, an automobile uh, for the masses. People did not travel distances. The roads did not exist. The bridges, the tunnels, the infrastructure did not exist. So at the time, it sounded like a bad idea. It only became a good idea uh, kind of in hindsight later on. Uh, so that's just like a small caveat. But to uh, answer the question that you posed about how does it work, what's the technology behind it, there are basically three steps to how we compute a, a security score. Step number one is we figured out a way of how to collect millions of different type of data points from all over the world that indicate to you resilience of companies. An analogy is you're driving in a neighborhood and you look at a house and you see broken windows, graffiti, and unmowed lawn. And so by just seeing that the house is not in a very good shape from outside, you can start making a observations. So part one is gathering the signals. Part two 
And what we do is, given a company name, we discover a tech surface of a company. What are the subsidiaries? What are the different subdomains of a company? And finally, part three is we give companies a score. And by sitting on six years of historical data, every time the company gets uh, breached, we go and backtest our data. And we've shown historically that companies with a bad score, a D or an F letter grade, are five and a half times uh, higher likelihood to get hacked than companies with an A score. And that's really kind of what we do, the three steps. Uh, I wanted to make sure I understood. So on the first step, it's looking more from outside to in. And so you're not injecting scripts. You're not actually uh, looking at the data within primarily on step one. It's really external data set. Uh, so can you give us a few examples of kinds of data types that you're looking at? Of course. So a trivial example might be you look at a website of a merchant or a company and you see an out-of-date copyright notice, copyright 2010. It's not a vulnerability. Hackers can't exploit it, but it gives you an indication that the company has not updated its website for over 10 years. So that's a trivial example. A more sophisticated example could be when the computers of a company are infected with malware. Typically what the malware does is it talks outbound to a central computer controlled by the hackers called a command and control computer. And that co computer dispatches instructions of what to do to millions of infected computers. And so we actually take binaries of malware. We have an R&D team that reverse engineers binaries of malware. And then uh, what they do is we sync whole uh, binaries of malware and uh, we have uh, millions and millions of sinkholes scattered all over the world, which the infected computers talk to. Like they basically think those are the hacker's computers, but they're actually controlled by scorecard. And so then we detect millions of infected computers worldwide, and we see in which computers are infected, how long the infection lasts. So that's just another example. So it could be really simple or really hard to get really complex signals that go into the score. Very interesting. Now, do you also look at uh, threats that's within organizations? Because oftentimes, uh, most of the security vulnerability oftentimes is not the firewall outside, but it's actually inside and the employees or partners. Yeah, so we look at all kinds of different uh, human related elements as well. For example, we look at when are there leaked credentials circulating on a hacker website. We look at when is it possible that a company might be more susceptible to phishing attacks when somebody might go and try to trick employees working for a company to go click on a particular link. So we try to ingest a lot of these signals that are observable from outside, and then it all feeds into the, uh, into the score and the algorithm that we provide. Hmm. Now, um, with the scorecard, it kind of has an implied notion of, let's call it insurance. Um, so how does that work? Because you mentioned back testing, historical testing, uh, but the, the subscribers of your essentially security credit ratings are taking it with, uh, uh, with a degree of confidence that it's going to be a certain degree of accuracy. So when, in fact, there is a deviation, uh, what is first the remediation on the side of the subscriber or the client? But more importantly, how do you ensure that your integrity of the scorecard and the methodology is continually updated and is as the best possible? I'll give you an analogy. You know, you have on the financial services side, you have Finch, S&P, uh, Moody's as an example. But even all of them have different scoring, different methodologies. And I think the industry may argue that even their methodology is not complete enough. So it it, it but yet, uh, companies are making big decisions off these rating systems. Yeah, so we have thousands of customers using our scores uh, for vendor risk management, reporting to the board of directors. Uh, we have insurance companies like Oxa Excel, Liberty Mutual, Willis Towers Watson, and many others who are using our scores and analytics to make insurance underwriting decisions. Um, the way that you ensure that people trust your score and your analytics is uh, there have to be a couple of things. So number one, transparency. If you go actually to a website called trust.securityscorecard.com, we publish our 
a methodology. We explain at a high level what are the factors that go into the score. What is the model? What are the limitations of the uh, scoring approach that we take from outside in? We publish statistics about uh, accuracy, remediation statistics, what type of signals that we collect. So step one to gain trust and acceptance in the industry is you have to publish what you do for uh, feedback. Uh, step number two is uh, context. The scores without con contextual information are meaningless. But we're a big believer that if you give a score to a company, you have, you, have, you have to explain the context, how was the score computed, what data, what elements went into the score. And also, more importantly, we tell the companies how to improve a score. Because if I give you a C letter grade, um, that's only part of the information. I have to also tell you how do you go from a C to an A. And showing this pathway to users of our system and to rated companies that our customers engage through scorecard um, is a very important part of what we do. So transparency, contextual information, and then a path to uh, a better score. Now, on the contextualized information that you talk about, so depending on the context of the rating, does that mean that a particular organization could have multiple ratings depending on the context presented? Uh, so we give one score. So we have many different uh, signals that go into the score, but we give one top level score to any company in the world. We have over 1.3 million companies rated. That's more than anybody else uh, in our industry. Uh, the way that we look at scores that we give is you can think of it almost like a probability distribution curve. Mm -hmm. If I give you if I give you like an A rating and a nation state adversary says, I'm gonna go hack you, they're going to succeed. Similarly, uh, if I give you a terrible rating, if I give you an F rating, and nobody targets you, well, you fly under the radar, you never get attacked, you never get targeted. So, uh, but if somebody really decides to go after a company with a bad score, they're gonna have an easier time getting in because similar to kind of like an analogy, if a house has broken windows and kind of like a rigidity lock on a door and unmowed lawn, 99% of the cases there's going to be nobody home, it's going to be easier for you to get in. So we're making the same judgments and analytical deductions about cybersecurity posture based on what we see from outside. Okay. Uh, one thing as you guys mentioned is this notion of 360 degree view of risk. Uh, let's take a, a concrete example. And again, I can't mention the company name, um, but this is a, a very well known a home security company that has, um, again, at the time of the recording, this is March 2020, has had quite a bit of issues around vulnerability, hacking. Um, so in, in that situation there, um, how does a rating work? I mean, would the rating have give some indication that this company, which was eventually acquired by a very large publicly traded company, would they, would they have known the potential risk level? And then also the rating frequency, how often does a rating change? And then post uh, attacks and some of the vulnerability issues that's, that's surface, after that event, does a rating also change and how quickly? Yeah, so th that's a very good question. Um, so the whole value proposition of what we do is uh, Currently, companies that do business with others have very little insight. So like a perfect example that you cited, if you have a M&A target, you, you're looking at a company that you want to acquire. Traditionally, what uh, companies have done is they would send a lengthy pen and paper questionnaire and they would just ask you, Scott, do you have two-factor authentication? Do you have uh, latest uh, antivirus and endpoint protection? I mean, do you have all these things? And of course, you want to get acquired so you're going to say, yes, I do. I mean, because you don't want somebody to get spooked away from acquiring your company. So everybody always wants to look good. And um, if, you go, if you went and asked a company, provide for me like a vulnerability scan or a security penetration test, they could provide it, but it's a point in time. Somebody could do like the most amazing rigorous assessment and you print it and a day later, a sleep-deprived IT administrator misconfigures the system and all of a sudden uh, the company suffers a data breach. Um, so the whole idea behind what we do is we wanted to do it continuously and non-intrusively from outside in. This way you didn't have to get a permission or consent about somebody being raided. You could do it from outside and you could do it all the time. 
So we update our ratings every single day. Like every single day, we update the ratings. We get the signals contributing the ratings continuously. Every single second, we collect millions of different type of signals. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, um, five and a half times uh, higher likelihood for poorly rated companies to suffer a data breach. And in many cases, we've seen score declines preceding the data breach. So in very many cases, we've seen indicators that something is going haywire, something is not going in the right direction um, for a company before they suffer the data breach. Because today, uh, they're basically, um, like the whole problem of the um, cybersecurity industry today is that there's a proliferation of cyber weapons. So hackers can just pull up a user interface or a script and scan the entire internet and discover all the companies where the same exploit or the same vulnerability can be easily applied. And they share this information very quickly with each other. In the meantime, the good guys, the companies are buried under mountains of paper, security architecture reviews, regulations, compliance frameworks, but they don't share all this information with each other. So we wanted to make the game a fair game and shine a light on where the security is in the ecosystem and by giving a score to yourself, to your suppliers, your m and targets, we hope that it's going to help the companies make more informed decisions. Yeah, uh, this is really interesting. And again, I'm not exactly sure how your product is positioned in the market in the sense of what I'm trying to get at is, um, you know, you can infer and have this as an input into a company valuation it's overall risk assessment. And if you think about Wall Street analysis, uh, even into buy sell signals for these analysts. So is your product from a product packaging and positioning also essentially sold to the likes of investors uh, and kind of let's call it the financial services and investment world as a barometer of their overall risk? Yeah, so we're working with a number of financial companies. Uh, in fact, uh, Two Sigma is an investor, minority investor into our company. Um, we have companies who are investment companies who look at this data and try to correlate how security signals could be used as alternative type of data. Uh, we have credit rating companies interested in this type of information, financial services companies. So uh, I actually see us not even as a cybersecurity company, I see us more like a data, more like a data bureau because yes. what we do, the scores are applicable in so many different directions for that's, that's board right. level reporting, yeah. underwriting, Absolutely. financial yeah. decisions. Yep, I agree. I agree. Absolutely agree with that. Now you mentioned before um, that for those with lesser than exceptional grades, you also provide a pathway to improve. Now the thing is. Best practices, is it's not that necessarily the best practices are not known. It's, a, it's around the issue of policies and execution, compliance and enforcement. Where do you feel like many organizations lack? So I think that there are a couple of um, problems. Uh, so number one, a lot of the time, organizations don't really know what's in their attack surface. So the attack surface has become exponentially more complex. Employees travel. They log in to work from hotel rooms, from homes. Every one of the computers they log in to work from is now an avenue of attack. Third-party vendors. Your data could be stored by a third-party law firm. It could be stored by some type of marketing organization. If you look at the target data breach, the hackers managed to break into Target through a compromise of a small air conditioning contractor called Fazio. They were doing maintenance on HVAC systems at Target. Hackers broke into Fazio. So it really was a Fazio data breach, except everybody now calls it a Target data breach because Target suffered the biggest loss. So problem number one, attack surface became exponentially more complex. Problem number two, proliferation of cyber weapons and companies don't share the same information that hackers do. And problem number three, which is actually where we have an opportunity to address it, 80% of the budget today that companies spend goes towards reactive instead of proactive solutions. And um, those reactive solutions are not effective in stopping the threats. And companies don't have a way to measure and quantify how much more secure they're becoming. For example, if I told you, Scott, you just invested 
one million dollars into the latest firewall product on the market did you become you know that you spent one million dollars but did you become five percent more secure ten percent more secure zero percent more secure nobody knows all you know is that you spent the money but there's no way for you to quantify it how much safer you, you, you're getting. So that's really the three compounding problems uh, that I'm seeing in the industry. So, so the last image is actually really interesting is that, are you able to create simulations? So if in fact they improve these elements, how that could correspond to an improved score uh, as a way to inform decision-making around budget and allocation for IT departments? Uh, absolutely. That's actually part of what we do. So when we give a score, we also give a breakdown of a score across several categories, application security, endpoint security, patch and cadence, network security. So one of our customers, uh, you know, a large bank, uh, they looked at our score and they saw that they're lacking in patch and cadence compared to some of their other peers in the financial services industry. Uh, the CISO went back to the management committee and got approval for additional budget to improve the patching. So we see in companies use our scores and the observations about areas where they lag compared to the rest of the industry as a way to justify budget and reprioritize, refocus their attention. Well, I think in terms of exposing a vulnerability, but I guess my question was really oriented towards, is there a way for you guys to provide predictability modeling saying that if you in fact invest two million dollars in this particular area that will result or correspond to x percentage increase in your overall score no it's a good it's a good idea yeah that's you know i think the security rating services space is still nascent there's a lot of interest in uh, you know gartner gartner recently stated that um security ratings will become as important as credit ratings in the next couple of years we started the company six years ago, and this year we're over 250 employees, over 1,000 plus customers, leading brands using us. But I would say that we're still only at the beginning of this journey. The market momentum is there, uh, the team is there, and you know a lot of excitement in the market is there. Um, my last question, <clears throat> um, second last question is, um, though security and privacy are distinctively different, uh, when you look at regu regulatory uh, changes like GDPR revision uh, that is pervasive, not just in Europe, but adapted to the respective domiciles, that's also an opportunity as well because GDPR at the end of the day is around compliance. How can this be extended to account for potential vulnerabilities around uh, violation likelihood of GDPR as an example? Yeah. So uh, I see compliance and cybersecurity as kind of two intersecting circles. So you could be secure but not compliant, and you could be compliant but not secure, but somewhere in between they kind of intersect. Um, so we map, we actually map the data and the signals that we discover to different type of compliance frameworks. So we map the information that we find from outside to all kinds of policies to GDPR, to PCI DSS for retail and payment industry, HIPAA for healthcare pharmaceuticals. Uh, and so uh, I actually think that a lot of these regulations with regards to privacy and not privacy are accelerants in a market. You know, for example, uh, you know, for example, as part of GDPR, you have to know and you have to have a method for sorting out how uh, different type of data processors operate on your data, right? So we help provide certain information around GDPR. So we're seeing very strong tailwinds in Europe. Like actually Europe has grown very quickly for us in the past year and a half. And we're seeing demand in Asia, in UK, in Germany, France, uh, Japan. Uh, and uh, GDPR does help accelerate and drive some of that demand. Good, good. So my final question is um, that we ask everyone is uh, what was perhaps a product or a project failure and the lessons that you learned that, that you can share with others? Well, look, I fail every week at something, uh, right? Um, so I, I think that, I mean, I think that the most important quality for any entrepreneur is resilience, but also you have to try many things and you have to learn from your mistakes 
and then try not to repeat those mistakes. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, I think that like a common problem actually for like many entrepreneurs is you try to do too much. Like, you know, you try to do too many features. You try to like, you get excited. You like, look at all the things, look at all the kind of different things that I could, that I could go tackle. Uh, but the reality is, and so, and so like, if I rewind the clock a couple of years ago, we tried to do lots of different interesting features, but maybe we, didn't spend enough time doubling down on one of those features to really make it amazing. So, but the reality is in startups and entrepreneurship and building amazing enterprise product, which we've built, uh, less is more. So this was an important lesson for me that was learned. I think the other important lesson um, is when the company was small, when we were like 10 people, communication was easy. You know, you all sit in the same room. If I call a customer and I say, crap, I lost that deal, Everybody turns and says, well, what feature do you need to build? You know, what marketing collateral do I need to write to help support you? So communication just happens by osmosis. When the company grew to 100 people, 150, 250, it was like, you know, the communication started becoming harder. It started breaking down. So this was a good reminder that I had to be crystal clear on a strategy. What are three main strategic objectives? How do I keep repeating them over and over again so that people who are in different regions who may not interact with me every single day learn those type of things? But again, you know, those insights don't just happen. They come through a lot of mistakes, failures, bumps, and, um, and you know, and ultimately you emerge stronger. Yeah, those are very practical. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So today I've been joined by Dr. Alexander Yampolsky, who is the CEO of Security Scorecard. Thanks for joining today. Scott, thank you very much.